Good evening everyone, this is Wayne over at the Alchemical Tech Revolution YouTube channel. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a little book called Freemasonry and Catholicism by a Mr. Max Heindel. And this book was written sometime before the year 1919. I couldn't exactly find the first publication date of this book, but uh, Mr. Heindel passed away in 1919, so we do know that it was written sometime before then. And in his description of this book, he describes it as an exposition of the cosmic facts underlying these two great inst institutions as determined by occult investigation. And this is a book put out by the Rosicrucian Fellowship. Uh, so this is a book that was originally intended only for initiates of the Rosicrucian orders. Uh, and tonight we're going to explore some very interesting facets of things in this book and we're only going to read uh, the the two last sections of the book part eight and part nine of this book and it's it's these are very short chapters so it shouldn't take us too long to get through this but uh, there's a lot of really good interesting information encoded in here so let's begin it starts at part eight the path of initiation in an earlier chapter, we noted that the transition of the adept from the dominion of death to the realm of immortality was foreshadowed in the daring leap of Hiram Abiff, the Grand Master, workman of Solomon's temple, into the seething sea of molten metal and his passage through the nine arch-like strata of the earth, which from form the path of initiation. We also remember that at the end of the journey, Hiram Abiff, the son of Cain received from his ancestor a new hammer and a new word for use in the new age. Going to pause right there, folks. Hiram Abiff, who are they talking about here? Well, this is talking about the Freemasons. Now, keep in mind, this is a Rosicrucian publication. So this is more proof positive that all these groups are interconnected at the topmost levels. And we'll see as we read along here when they're referring in this book to Freemasonry and Catholicism. You could look at that as uh, not just Catholicism, but the Jesuit order. Okay, so the Freemasons and the Jesuits. And what we'll see as we get into this exactly what the deal is with the Freemasons and the Jesuits and why uh, they are interconnected and how the Rosicrucian order actually points this out here. But anyway, let's, let's just hit on some of those key points we just saw. So they're talking about Hiram Abiff. Now this is the Grand Master. This is the, the figure that the Freemasons exonerate uh, as like the Master Mason or the, the archetypal uh, Master Mason. Okay, so if you know anything about Freemasonry, Hiram Abiff, the story is he was the builder that crafted Solomon's temple and he was murdered by three acolytes that wanted him to tell them the secrets of his craft and he wouldn't tell them the secrets of the craft so they murdered him for it in in the old legend but anyway they've kind of deified this figure Hiram Abiff and you'll see as we go on how he equates to different figures from different religious systems and different mythologies and things of that nature so uh, he was the grand master workman of Solomon's temple and uh, we see here, this is talking about how he is the son of Cain. And this will be important later, and we'll see why. But uh, he received from his ancestor, that would be Cain. So Hiram Abiff was given by Cain a new hammer and a new word for use in the new age. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? Well, let's read on a little further and see what else this has to say. According to the Gospels, we also find that Jesus, the son of Seth, now remember that, folks, this is a little aside from me, Jesus was the son of Seth, whereas Hiram Abiff is the son of Cain, okay? Jesus, the son of Seth, immediately after his descent from Golgotha, entered the subterranean strata where he remained for some time in communion with the spirits who dwell there. Thus, the various strata of the earth from the circumference to the center form the path of initiation both for the sons of Seth and the sons of Cain, and that is the reason why little or nothing is said of the inner construction of the earth in the multitude of books dealing with subjects of occultism. 
Those who are simply psychics do not know, and those who do know are not saying much. There is a chapter on the subject in the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, which gives about all that one dares to tell, and to that the reader is referred for further information than given here. Gonna pause right there, folks. That's the author of this book telling you that. He also wrote another book called The Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, and this is a much longer book and talks about the various uh, beliefs of the Rosicrucian order and how it relates to all these different uh, archetypes of inner worlds and outer worlds and things of that nature and talking about the path of initiation in many different ways but uh, <clears throat> let's continue on the path of initiation is guarded in various ways while we walk the earth in our physical bodies we are drawn toward the center of the earth by the force of gravitation but our bodies being solid that is to say, of the same density as the material whereof our globe is composed, we are thus prevented from sinking through the earth by displacement as we would sink in water, or by interpenetration as we would pass through ether. When death comes, and we shed this so-called mortal coil, we find ourselves in vehicles that are finer than the elements of the earth. A person clothed in, clothed in these finer vehicles could easily penetrate through the various strata of our globe to the center if there were no other obstacles. Having shed the dense body, he is no longer subject to gravitation, but to levitation, and on that account he usually finds it sufficiently difficult to stay upon the surface of the earth. Only during the first part of his post-mortem experience, when he is still loaded down with the coarsest ether and desire stuff, is this possible for him. The more he has gathered of that denser substance by indulgence of his lower nature and cultivation of the habit of drunkenness, covetousness, hatred, malice, immoral emotions, and disreputable vices, the easier it is for him to stay around low saloons, gambling houses, red light districts, and kindred places. But the man of high ideals and lofty aspirations, who would be the only likely to seek the path of initiation, feels the impelling force of levitation drawing him outward into the purer strata of the air where the first heaven is located and is thus effectually prevented from trespassing upon the path of initiation. Stories are told of initiates having overcome the law of gravitation in order to rise in the air at certain times for a definite purpose while still in the dense body. Initiates are also taught how to suspend the law of levitation when they are in their soul bodies and how to pass through the nine strata of the earth. It is said that Jesus was the son of a carpenter, but the Greek word is tekton, that's spelled T-E-K-T-O-N, and means builder. Arche, A-R-C-H-E, is the Greek name of primordial matter. It is also said that Jesus was a carpenter himself, or tecton, it says in parentheses here. <clears throat> it is true he was a tecton, builder or mason, a son of God, the grand architecton, and that's spelled A-R-C-H-E-T-E-K-T-O-N. At the age of 33, when he had taken the three times three, nine degrees of mystic masonry, he descended to the center of the earth. So does every other tecton, mason, or free mason, and that's spelled P-H-R-E-E-M-E-S-S-E-N, and it says in parentheses here, child of light, as the Egyptian called such, descend through the nine arch-like strata of the earth. We shall find at the time of the first advent of Christ both Hiram Abiff, the son of Cain, and Solomon, the son of Seth, reborn to take from him the next great initiation into the Christian mysteries. And we're going to pause right there, folks, and try and break down a little bit of this stuff for you. <clears throat> okay, so what this is describing is this is describing the uh, conception that the uh, Rosicrucians have of what the natural order looks like and what the spiritual realms look like, okay? So you could see their idea is this physical plane we live in, we're made of dense matter, and when we shed this mortal coil or, or pass on, we take on this soul body or spirit body that is made of, of less dense material. 
and at that time we would elevate to higher planes the first heaven second heaven like they they describe a lot of this in that uh, uh, rosicrucian cosmo conception book um, so if you're interested in looking at that kind of stuff this is how they describe uh, the different planes of reality the planes of existence the you know planes of the afterlife and such but what they do say is that uh, the path of initiation occurs within the earth and this is why the ancient mystery schools they did all their initiation uh, rituals and stuff in caves or you know cave-like dwellings and this is precisely what things like the pyramids were built for uh to to kind of uh uh you know be that type of a dwelling place for initiation so when we're looking at this stuff this is what they're saying so they're saying the initiation process it happens in a more spiritual mode because you know your dense body can't pass into the earth for initiation so they're equating a very spiritual um, out of body type experience to this whole idea of initiation and they talk about the, the nine strata the nine different layers of the earth and that's why many initiatory orders have nine levels of initiation that they take even uh, the order the York Rite of Freemasonry uh, has nine different degrees of initiation in their standard, uh, um, you know, lodge. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. But you see how they're calling Jesus. They're saying he was one of these Freemasons. And that's an important thing here to point out. Freemason, P-H-R-E-E-M-E-S-S-E-N, or a child of light. This is where the term really comes from, or so they claim. Freemason, child of light. It has nothing to do with stoneworking. Okay, that's just kind of the guild that they hid a lot of their secrets and their symbology in, um, moving ahead here through time. Or at least this is what they claim. <coughs> but anyway, let's get back to this because you see now they pulled Jesus into this uh, Masonic type idea or tradition. So they're calling this the initiation of the christian mysteries so they're they're equating this to mystery school teachings uh so let's continue on okay it says here here's where we left off in the last chapter we saw while well, considering the philosopher's stone that the spinal cord is the principal laboratory for the alchemist and that the spinal spirit fire generated by turning the creative force upward through the spinal canal, passing it between the pituitary body, body and the pineal gland in the brain, gives to a man a third eye, as it were, wherewith to see in the spiritual world. It's going to pause right there, folks. Uh, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, many of these secret orders, they, they do believe that uh, we have a lower animal nature and a higher spiritual nature, and that our higher spiritual nature, it, this has to do with the, the chakra system and uh, where the chakras are located so it, your lower animal form uh, that chakra area uh, coincides with the genitals and that's where uh, they're talking about the creative force you see as we move on here it i think it talks about here a little later on about what they believe about this creative force how man was split his creative force was split whereas at one time he was able to physically reproduce all by himself without having the male and female split um, <clears throat> that he was sort of an androgynous being and he was able to reproduce from himself but what happens is see according to this they turn part of that creative spirit upward into higher material things and this equates uh, back to like the head chakra and throat chakra and stuff like that upwards get part of your creative force upwards and this is when they claim that the split between male and female occurred within the human uh, being so i know it sounds a little fanciful uh, for some people uh you know if if you're really indoctrinated in our modern system it's it's kind of hard to think in these terms but uh, this is absolutely how the people in the positions of power think and believe see that's the whole thing they have a completely different set of sciences and a completely different set of belief systems than the standard uh, public does and they act upon these and they do they are able to actually garner some control with some of these philosophical ideas because many of them are, are archetypal in nature and they can uh, steer these things the natural forces that that uh, kind of uh, operate these things and use them 
for different purposes. So that's that's kind of what we're talking about. But let's get back to this. But so what they're talking about when they're talking about that spinal spirit fire, they believe the spinal column uh, in the human being is the conduit for this this uh, use of the the creative force, or so they call it, where it, you could either use it for higher spiritual purposes and it raises up to the brain that's why the brain's at the top of the spinal column or the lower areas down uh, where it ends in the pelvis with the genitals so they've they believe the split in the human creative force in this way so you could choose to use it for the animal material purposes or for the higher purposes so this is what they're talking about with that but anyway <clears throat> let's move on so they're talking about uh, uh, between the pituitary body and the pineal gland in the brain, this gives man a third eye where man could see into spiritual worlds. Let's pick up from there. When this serpentine spirit fire has been sufficiently evolved, he may read by its light the wisdom of the ages. Therefore, Christ exhorted his disciples to be wise as serpents. The Egyptian word naja, N-A-J-A, which means serpent, is used at least once in the Hebrew Bible in the 58th Psalm. In ancient Egypt, the pharaohs were kings and priests, holding a double office, and they therefore wore a double crown with a uraeus, or a serpent head, so placed that when wearing this crown, the uraeus seemed to protrude from the emperor's forehead between the eyebrows. The serpentine uraeus was therefore an apt symbol of the wisdom of the wearer. Going to pause right there again, folks. Pay attention closely to what they're saying here. The the priest, the pharaohs were priests and kings. They held a, a dual office, a double office. Okay, that'll be important here later as we go forward, and we'll see why. We'll we'll get there, and uh, also remember the word naja, or also known as naga in other languages, and this means serpent. Let's continue on. It will be remembered that according to the Bible story, the Lucifer spirit appeared to Eve as a serpent, a son of wisdom. Cain, according to the Masonic legend, was born from this union with Eve. Going to pause right there. You see that, folks? The Masons and very many other secret orders believe that Eve's first child, Cain, was not from Adam, but it was from Lucifer. And this is why we have all of this... Uh, emphasis on bloodlines and the split between these bloodlines okay they believe that they're partially divine or that they're they're partially you know angelic or fallen angelic per se uh the people that hold this bloodline so th this is where they're going here so let's let's go ahead and get back to the reading there i don't want to harp too much on that because you'll see more as we go along it is also stated that the Lucifer spirit then left Eve, who thus became a widow. And Cain was thus the son of the Lucifer spirit, the serpent of wisdom, and Eve the widow. I'm going to pause there again. Masons use the term the widow's son. They call themselves sons of a widow, or the widow's son. Here it is. That's what they're referring to. Uh, they, they are the children of Cain. The children of Lucifer. That's what they're claiming when they say that, whether they realize it or not. Okay, let's get back to this. Every initiate to this day has the serpent symbol on his brow and is known to his fellows by the token as a son of the widow and the Lucifer spirit. Therefore, we shall trace Hiram Abiff to his next embodiment by that mark, and as evidence given by a part party against his own interest in particularly valuable according to law. We call special attention to the following points gained from the Catholic Latin Testament. Now, before we read on here, I'm going to do another a little aside here. You see, they're talking about we shall trace Hiram Abiff to his next embodiment by that mark. They're talking about an office, the same way they talk about Christ or the, or the Christos. They see this as being an office, okay? That this is a title that could be passed from person to person. Hiram Abiff is an archetypal idea. It's an archetype of an office, and they believe the same thing with Christ. And we'll get there. Let's continue on. Now, we were saying... Um, we, we call special attention to the following points gained from the Catholic Latin Testament. In 1 Samuel 19, King James Version, Naoth, and that's spelled N-A-I-O-T-H, is spoken of as a place where a school of prophets and seers dwelt, Samuel among others. 
Naoth is the feminine plural of Naja, a serpent, which we have already mentioned as being an Egyptian word used in the Bible. In the Latin version, the same place is spoken of as Naim, N-A-I-M, and Esubius says it was located near Endor, famous as the abode of the witch, through whose instrumentality Saul spoke with Samuel after the latter had passed on. But it is not to be supposed that Naoth and Naim are places, or that they were used interchangeably. They describe two widely different classes of spiritually gifted people, which the ancient Egyptians had marked by placing the uraeus upon the brows of one and at the navels of the other. Pay attention here. You see they're, they're separating out these two classes, these spiritually different classes. The latter were mediumistic persons receiving impressions from spirit controls through the solar plexus. They were properly designated naoth by the Hebrews who used the feminine suffix to indicate their negative qualities. But the voluntary clairvoyant and the initiate, represented by the Egyptians as having the serpentine uraeus in the forehead, were called naim by the Hebrews, who used the male suffix to designate the positive spiritual faculty which they possess. In the Latin Catholic version of the New Testament, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 15, speaks of the person raised by Christ as the widow's son of Nain, N-A-I-N, very similar to N-A-I-M. <clears throat> Let's continue on. As the serpent is not fully unfolded until the ninth arch of the lesser mysteries has been passed and the candidates become aspirants to the greater mysteries, and further because the Lodge of Freemason, that's P-H-R-E-E-M-E-S-S-E-N, -E 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 children of light, of ancient Egypt are now transferred to the various branches of the Anglo-Saxon race, where the sound Nain means nine. The original word has been corrupted to mislead all not entitled to the knowledge. Going to pause right there, folks. They lie even to their own initiates until you reach high enough level uh, within these orders before they tell you the true meanings and or what they, they say are the true meanings or the true symbols behind these, what the meanings are behind all these symbols and things. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is what they're they're doing. The word has been corrupted to mislead all that are not entitled to that knowledge. Uh, and you notice they they put emphasis on the Anglo-Saxon race there. We'll we'll get to that too. Let's move on here as we we do this reading. Uh, as we read on, folks, you'll see a lot of these these dots will connect themselves for you. I don't think I have to point out too much. Back to the reading. But all things change on this terrestrial sphere, and this applies also to the methods of initiation and the requirements thereof. Hiram Abiff failed in his great effort to make the molten sea at the time when he was building Solomon's temple because he, the son of the fiery Lucifer spirits, did not know how to blend the element fire with the water poured into his mold by the sons of Seth, the creatures of the water god Jehovah. At that time, he was given a new hammer and a new word. The hammer was in the form of a cross. The word was written upon a disc before he was finally slain by his adversaries, and so he slept until, as Lazarus, the widow's son of Nain, he was raised by the strong grip of the lion's paw, the lion of Judah. Then the disc was found, also the new cruciform hammer, and upon the disc the mystic symbol, the rose. In these two symbols lie hidden the great secret of life, the blending of water and fire, as symbolized by the earth-born fluidic sap ascending through the stem and calyx of the flower to the fire-tinted tint petals born in the purity of the sun, when the sun is capitalized S-U-N, but still guarded by the thorns of the martial Lucifer spirits. Going to pause right there, folks. You hear that? They're saying Jehovah, the water god, uh, the sons of Seth, the creatures of the water. Do you see where this is going? Here's your big division among these different secret societies. The sons of Cain are the sons of fire, 
and the sons of Seth, or also uh, the Christians, or, you know, the Christian orders, or the uh, religious orders, as opposed to the Masons being the philosophical orders, are the, the water orders. So see, water and fire. All right, and we'll get there. <clears throat> and the rose, see the Rosicrucians point out the rose as the fusion of these two things, of the water and the fire. Okay, let's get back to the reading, though. Exoteric masonry, which is only the husks of the mystic order formed by the sons of Cain, has in modern times attracted the masculine element with its positively polarized physical vehicles and educated them in industry and statecraft, thus controlling the material development of the world. The sons of Seth, constituting themselves the priestcraft, have worked their spell over the positive vital bodies of the feminine element of dominant spiritual development. And whereas the sons of Cain, working through Freemasonry and kindred movements, have openly fought for the temporal power, the priestcraft has fought as strenuously and perhaps more effectively by stealth to retain their hold upon the spiritual development of the feminine element. You see here, I'm going to pause again, folks. They're talking about the fusion of statecraft and priestcraft. Hmm, where have we heard that before? The, the church and the state, do you see? Why, why is there a separation in America, supposedly, between the church and the state? This is exactly why, because, see, these power structures at the topmost levels, they're always kind of shifting power back and forth. They're fighting back and forth for control. And this all goes back, once again, to the sons of Cain and the sons of Seth. Your fire... Your philosophers of fire versus, you know, your uh, beings of the water, the, the sons of water and the sons of fire. Uh, and it's all about finding balance. And you see, uh, the sons of water are more associated with priestcraft, whereas the masons or, you know, the sons of fire are associated with statecraft. And that is why so many masons sit in high-ranking positions in governments. See, that's what this is about government or this statecraft being the masculine principle and religious ideas or spiritual ideas as the feminine uh, aspect of these different things and uh, you, you could see how these ideas kind of shift back and forth and fight against each other but also in fighting against each other they work hand in hand and it's a perfect system for steering control um, <clears throat> so anyway let's let's get back on to the reading here <clears throat> the casual onlooker, it would seem as if... Oh, sorry. Let me start again. To the casual onlooker, it would seem as if there were no decided antagonism between these two movements at the present time, but though Freemasonry of today is but a shell of its true ancient mystic self, and though Catholicism has been terribly tarnished by the touch of time, in this one thing there is no difference, namely... That the war is as keen as ever. And I'm going to pause right there. When he's referring to Catholicism here, folks, think of Jesuit. Okay? Think of Jesuit. Same thing, pretty much interchangeable, because that's, that's who runs Catholicism, or the Catholic Church, the Jesuits. <coughs> okay. The efforts of the church are not concentrated upon the masses, however, as much as upon those who are seeking to live the higher life, so that they may gain admission to the mystery temple and learn how to make the philosopher's stone. As mankind advances in evolution, the vital body becomes more permanently positively polarized, giving to both sexes a greater desire for spirituality. And though we change from the masculine to feminine in alternate embodiments, positive polarity of the vital body is becoming more pronounced regardless of sex. This accounts for the growing tendency towards altruism, which is even being brought out by the suffering entitled by the Great War we are now fighting. And it says in parentheses 1918, For all agree that the nations are seeking to obtain a lasting peace where the swords may be made into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. In the past, humanity has been claiming universal brotherhood as a great ideal, but we must come closer than that to being in full accord with the Christ. He said to his disciples, Ye are my friends. 
Among brothers and sisters, hate and enmity may exist, but friendship is the expression of love and cannot exist apart from that. Universal friendship is therefore the magic word, which will eventually level all distinctions, bring peace upon earth, and goodwill among men. This is the great ideal, which points the shortest way to the new heaven and the new earth, where the sons of Cain and the sons of Seth will eventually be united. <clears throat> I'm going to pause right there, folks. You hear that? You see what they're trying to do? They're trying to reunite these opposing forces. Okay? The fire and the water. These ideas. <clears throat> the Masons, the Jesuits, you know, these bitter arch rivals that uh, struggle back and forth for power and control. They eventually are looking for, for unity, a new world order. You see, that's what it's all about. The new world order will come about when these factions finally work together and unite uh, statecraft and priestcraft into a perfect uh, technocracy. That's, that's exactly what they're talking about here. Um, and that was the end of part eight. We're going to go to part nine here of the book, and we're just going to finish up. And I'll start reading here in a minute. Just going to clear my throat for a second. <coughs> okay, let's begin. Part 9. Armageddon, the Great War, and the Coming Age. The chart printed in Part 5 shows that there was an age when humanity lived in peace and happiness under the guardianship of a ruler who held the double office of king and priest being both temporal and spiritual head of the double-sexed human race. He is called Melchizedek in the Bible terminology, and it is said that he was king of Salem, Salem meaning peace. Since then, humanity has been divided into two sexes, male and female, and placed under the dual rulership of a king having dominion over their temporal affairs and aiming to advance them by industry and statecraft, and a priest, head of the priestcraft, exercising a spiritual authority in such a manner as they considered for the eternal good of their charges. Going to pause right there, folks. You see that? They're speaking back to uh, Mel Melchizedek, okay, <clears throat> as being the first to have this dual office of king and priest. And they say at that time that the human race was double sexed, that they were both sexes in, in themselves, and they were split. Um, you could see the, the cosmology, once again, comes into play here, what, what they believe. They believe that, like I said, at, at a time in the distant past, that uh, we were able to use our creative force, much, much like a plant does, and just recreate off of ourselves, uh, by ourselves, and that uh, it's only through the turning, the gift of, of knowledge, of primordial knowing, uh, the gift of intellect from Lucifer, uh, this is what they believe. This is not what I believe, but this is what they're saying and what they believe. But they're saying that because of that gift, man was able to turn part of his creative force upward to more spiritual ideas and develop his brain and language and all of this. And this is when the sexes were split because of this. Because they were only able to apportion half of their creative force towards reproduction then. <coughs> so, this is when the split happened, supposedly, between the fire ideas and the water ideas okay so yeah, i don't know how well you're following along but i'm hoping you're following because i i know it's it's sometimes for some people used to you know our modern world this line of thinking is not something that's really taught or or really something that most people could reason with but this is what these people believe and they totally act on it so um uh, Anyway, you, you could see the point here. The, the priesthood of Melchizedek. This is the, uh, the, the merging of statecraft and priestcraft. The fire, the water, all these ideas into one authority figure. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get back to the reading. The statecraft employed by the sons of Cain holds up the male ideal, Hiram Abiff, the master craftsman, the son of fire, while the sons of Seth as priestcraft uphold the female idea in the Virgin Mary, the Lady of the Sea. 
Thus, fire and water, male and female, church and state, are opposed to each other, with the inevitable result that a great war has been waged ever since the separation, that sin, sorrow, and death are rampant, and that humanity is praying for the day of redemption, when the two streams shall be united in the kingdom of heaven, where there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage, and where reigns Christ, the King of Peace, exercising the dual office of king and priest after the order of Melchizedek for the good of all. Going to pause right there. You hear that? There it is. I don't think I could really uh, uh, explain it much clearer than, than that as to what they're talking about here. And if you think about this and expound upon those ideas, you'll see exactly uh, through this, this idea here why our society functions how it does and why we're in the state that we're in right now because of this split and this supposed... Uh, you know, uh, th this uh, attempt to uh, reunite these two opposing forces, the, the water ideas and the fire ideas. But anyway, let's get back to the reading. Going to clear my throat again <coughs> and get back to this. Got a little cold or something here. <laughs> but this new order cannot come into existence in a day. It requires ages of preparation not only of the land itself, but of the people who are to inhabit it. And in order to gain an idea of what that land is like, and how the people are constituted, it will be helpful to consider the evolutionary career of humanity which has brought us the land where we live to our present status. That will then give us the perspective to see what is in store for us in the future. The biblical and occult traditions agree with science that there was a time when darkness brooded over the deep of space, where the material for the coming earth planet was being gathered together and set in motion by the divine hierarchs, that this stage was followed by a period of luminosity, when the dark cloud of matter had become a fire mist, that this was followed by a period when the cold of space and the heat of the planet in the making generated an atmosphere of steam close to the fiery core and mist further from the fiery center. When the mist had cooled sufficiently, it fell again as rain upon the fiery core to be re-evaporated, and this continues in endless cycles until by repeated boiling of the waters an incrustation began to form around the fiery core. Upon the islands of crust in the ocean of fire, we first learn of humanity dwelling in solid physical bodies, where, of course, very dissimilar to those we have today. During the next stage, the crust of the earth became sufficiently strong to cover the whole inner core, and humanity lived then in the basins of the earth in the land of mist, which was so dense that breathing was accomplished by means of gill clefts, similar to those of the fishes and still seen in human embryos. Gonna pause right there again, folks. <clears throat> uh, this part of their cosmology uh, is very debatable, okay? And is com comparing that men breathe through gill clefts similar to those of fishes that are still seen today in human embryos? They're not, folks. Those are not gill slits in human em embryos. That's been proven over and over and over again. That's an old idea uh, that has been totally disproven. Uh, we do not at any point during our gestation ever have gills. Okay? Uh, I know some people will claim that, but uh, go check out a biology textbook, a modern biology textbook, or ask a... Uh, um, an OBGYN about the development of the fetus and if the fetus has gills that never happens there are these slits that uh, you know are there but they are not gills nor are they anything like gills <laughs> so uh, this is this has been you know disproven but you could see how he's using the science of the day the quote unquote science of the day to uphold his ideas here uh, anyway, that's just a little aside from me. Uh, let's get back to the reading. <clears throat> when the mists of Atlantis commenced to settle, some of our forebears had grown embryonic lungs and were forced to the highlands years before their compeers. Therefore, they wandered in the wilderness while the promised land, as we know it today, was emerging from the lighter fogs and 
At the same time, their growing lungs were fitting them to live under the present atmospheric conditions. Two more races were born in the basins of the earth, after the pioneers had left it. Then a succession of floods drove them all to the highlands. The last flood took place when the sun, by procession, entered the watery sign Cancer, about 10,000 years ago, as told Plato by the Egyptian priests. Thus we see that there is no sudden change of constitution or environment for the whole human race when a new epoch is ushered in, but an overlapping of conditions which make it possible for the majority by gradual adjustment to enter the new conditions. Though the change may seem sudden to the individual when the preparatory work has been accomplished unconsciously, the metamorphosis of a frog from a denizen of the water to the airy element give an analogy of the past emergence of humanity from the continent of Atlantis to the Rainbow Age of Ariana, and the transformation of an earthworm to a butterfly soaring the skies is an apt illustration of the coming change from our present state and condition to those of the New Galilee, where the kingdom of Christ will be established, and what the change in the human constitution and environment is to be, may be seen by examining the past conditions as outlined in the Bible, which agrees with the occult traditions in the main points. The new heaven and new earth is now in the making. When the heavenly time marker, the sun, came into Aries by procession, a new cycle commenced, and the glad tidings were preached by Christ. He said by implication that the new heaven and earth were not ready then, when he told his disciples, Whither I go, ye cannot now follow, but you shall follow afterwards. I go to prepare a place for you, and will come again and receive you. Later, John saw in a vision the new Jerusalem descending from heaven, and Paul taught the Thessalonians by the word of the Lord that those who are Christ's at his coming shall be caught up in the air to meet him and be with him for the age. This is in line with the tendencies shown by past developments. The Lemurians lived very close to the fiery core of the earth. The Atlanteans inhabited the basins somewhat farther away from the center. The Aryans were driven by the flood to the hilltops where they are now living. And analogously, the citizens of the coming age will inhabit the air. Going to pause right there, folks. We're switching from a water age to an air age here. We're going into the age of Aquarius. This is exactly what they believe and what they're talking about. And uh, you could see, uh, if you go back and listen to some of the... Uh, you know, past several episodes of Crow Triple Seven Radio, uh, this is what Crow's talking about. Um, we are certainly entering into a new age now. What all is involved with that? Who can say? Um, but the thing is, undoubtedly, when you look back and refer back to these essential uh, archetypal elemental ideas, these are what's coming into play. We're switching from an age of water to an age of air. That's what it's speaking of here. Because what do you get when you combine fire and water? What does that make? It makes steam. Steam being an element of air. You see? So we're, we're raising to a new age, an age of air. And this is what all these, uh, you know, dark occultists at the top of the power structure are ushering in. And that's why they're... they're uh, doing these things where, where they're making these um, these different allegories and stuff in our, our media and all over the entertainment and everywhere you look, why they're making these references to things that equate to air. All you have to do is like look around at things that are going on. Pay attention to the stories in the news. Pay attention to uh, the television shows, the movies, all of these things. Commercials, everything equating to air. All these air concepts, air ideas, you'll see. When, when you start to pay attention, you'll see. This is what they're doing. They're signaling to those in the know that it's the coming of the new age, this age of Aquarius, as they call it. And uh, this age, this new coming age, it's, it's many different things to many different people. And uh, only time will really tell what becomes of it all. Uh, and here's the thing. I mean, there's, there's two paths we can go by. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's the right-hand path or the left-hand path. So 
depending upon if we let these people in charge get their way, we'll go down this dystopian left-hand path road. Or if we stand up and uh, reject what they're putting forward here for us, we could go down a much better path and have a better future. So that's why it's important that we speak up and we, we talk about these ideas. I mean, whether you believe that this stuff is true or not, make no mistake about it. Those people that are in charge in this world very much believe that this is true and they will act on those beliefs and what they do to act on those beliefs will affect you. So you need to uh, be mindful of this and understand where it is they're coming from, what it is they believe, why they do the things they do. And if you reject it or if you reject what they're doing with it, uh, you can have some say. We are much more powerful than we believe. So that's why it's important that we as individuals and uh, small groups and stuff speak up and remove our consent from the system because the people steering it right now are absolutely only have themselves in mind and have very uh, greedy and dark purposes in mind for all of us. And we need to take our power back and make a better future. So... Let's get back to the reading. But we know that our dense body gravitates toward the center of the earth. Therefore, a change must take place. Also, Paul tells us that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he also points out that we have a soma sushikon, mistranslated natural body. It says in, in parentheses. So we have this soma sushikon, a mistranslated natural body. A soul body. See, that's what he's talking about here, just as an aside. He describes it as a soul body. And this is made of ether, which is lighter than air, and therefore capable of levitation. This is the golden wedding garment, the philosopher's stone, or the living stone, spoken of in some of the ancient philosophies, as the diamond soul. For it is luminous, lustrous, and sparkling, a priceless gem. It was also called the astral body by the medieval alchemists because of the ability it conferred upon the one who has, has it to traverse the starry regions. But it is not to be confounded with the desire body which some of the modern pseudo-occultists mistakenly call the astral body. This vehicle, the soul body, will eventually be evolved by humanity as a whole but during the change from the Aryan epoch to the ethereal conditions of the New Galilee, there will be pioneers who precede their brethren, as the original Semites did in the change from Atlantis to Ariana. Christ mentioned this class in Matthew 11th chapter 12th verse when he said, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That is not a correct translation. It ought to be the kingdom of the heavens has been invaded. The Greek, it says in parentheses, the Greek is by axetai. And invaders seize on her. Men and women already have learned through a holy, helpful life to lay aside the body of flesh and blood, either intermittently or permanently, and to walk the skies with winged feet, intent upon the business of their Lord clad in the ethereal wedding garment of the new dispensation. This change may have been accomplished through a life of simple help, helpfulness and prayer as practiced by devoted Christians. No matter with what church they are affiliated, if they follow the path of the sons of Seth, Others have attained by following the specific exercises given by the Rosicrucians, and thus the process of the unification of the two streams is already underway. But the war between the flesh and the spirit is still raging in the breast of most people as fiercely as it was in the days when Paul gave vent to his pent-up feelings and told us how the flesh was warring against the spirit within himself and how he did the wrong things which he would not do and omitted good deeds which he aspired so ardently to perform. Now, will the struggle ever cease for the mystic mason until he has learned to build the temple made without hands, which is not completed until he come to the 18th, 1 plus, not plus 8, it says in, in the parentheses, degree, which is the degree of the Rose Croix, or Rose Cross. This is the ultimate of the 33rd degree, for 3 times 3 are 9, 
and 1 plus 8 are 9, 9 being the highest degree in the lesser mysteries. He who has passed this degree of the genuine mystic order is then, and then only, the widow's son of nine, or Nain, ready to be raised by the strong grip of the lion's paw, of the lion of Judah, to the kingdom of the heavens, there to receive the well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. For him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the house of God. Thence he shall no more go out. He is then immortal, loosed from the wheel of birth and death. Pretty interesting stuff, isn't it, folks? Now we're just going to finish up by reading the summary here. Summary. And this sums up the entire book. And if you guys could get your hands on this book, it's it's worth a read because, uh, you know, it points out a lot of interesting ideas uh, that are taught within the Rosicrucian order and within the Masons and even uh, throughout some of the other secret societies, such as, uh, you know, the Jesuits and, and all of these different ideas. But you could see what the whole gist of it is here. The reuniting of the fire and water ideas, the, the state and the church, you see? And that's why there's such a push on for this new world order and the changing over of the age. Do you see how it all connects together? Anyway, let's go ahead. Here's the summary now. In conclusion, it may be well to sum up the points which have been made in these articles on Freemasonry and Catholicism, it being understood that the term Catholicism, as here used, does not refer to the Roman Catholic Church alone, Catholic being taken in the sense of universal, so that the term includes all movements inaugurated by the sons of Seth, the priestcraft. The origin of the temporal and spiritual streams of evolution are as follows. Jehovah created Eve, a human being. The Lucifer spirit, Samael, united with Eve and begat a semi-divine son, Cain. As he left Eve before the birth of the child, Cain was the son of a widow and a serpent of wisdom. Then Jehovah created Adam, a human being like Eve. Adam and Eve united and begat a child, human like themselves, whose name was Abel. Jehovah, being the lunar god, is associated with water. Hence there was enmity between Cain, the son of fire, and Abel, the son of water. So Cain slew Abel, and Abel was replaced by Seth. In time and through generations, the sons of Cain became the craftsmen of the world, skilled in the use of fire and metal. Their ideal was male, Hiram Abiff, the master workman. Going to pause right there. Also, Tubal Cain, the uh, inventor of everything, pretty much, was the son of Cain, right? Uh, craftsmen, you see. These were the statecraft, the craftsmen. Um, <clears throat> anyway, let's continue on. The sons of Seth, on the other hand, became the churchmen, upholding the feminine ideal, the Virgin Mary, and ruling their people by the magic water placed at their temple doors. Various attempts have been made to unite the two streams of humanity and emancipate them from their progenitors, Jehovah and the Lucifer spirits. See, I'm going to pause right there. You see, folks, they're equating uh, God, the Creator, with the name Jehovah here, and they're also using the Lucifer spirits. And uh, you see the way they represent them, they re represent them as being equals in power and, you know, equals in co-creation. And that's that's not the case. Um, but this is the way that they're portrayed. This is what these people believe. Okay. Uh, but let's get on with it. I don't want to tie up too much time with that. With this end in view, the symbolical temple was built according to the instruction of Solomon, the son of Seth, and the molten sea was cast by Hiram Abiff, the son of Cain. But the main object was frustrated, as we have seen, and the attempt at unification proved abortive. Moses, the divinely appointed leader of the old dispensation, afterward reborn as Elijah, guided humanity through its ages of infancy and was finally embodied as John the Baptist the herald of the new dispensation, the Christian era. At the same point in time, the other actors in the world drama, going to pause right there, you hear that? Actors in the world drama, and they capitalize world and drama there. Uh, and there's a reason for that, because it's, it's, the world is a stage, folks. It's all an act. Like, a lot of it's all just an act. Um, anyway, let's get, continue on with that. At the same point in time, the other actors in the world drama were also brought to birth 
that they might serve their brothers. At the casting of the molten sea, Hiram Abiff had been given the baptism of fire by Cain, which freed him from the Lucifer spirits. He was also given a new hammer and a new word. When the new era dawned, he was born as Lazarus, the widow's son of Nain, and raised by the strong grip of the lion's paw to the rank of immortals as Christian Rosencruz. <laughs> you hear that, folks? I'm going to pause right there. You hear that? So who's Christian Rosencruz? This is Cain, reborn. Um, pretty much through all of it. Hiram Abiff, the son of Cain, reborn. It's an archetypal idea, you see. Um, Christian Rosencruz and uh, Hiram Abiff are essentially the same thing. It's, it's an ideal. It's an archetype uh, used by the secret societies. It's just a different name. The Rosicrucians call him uh, Christian Rosencruz, whereas the Masons call him Hiram Abiff, or they call this ideal uh, by those names. Let's continue on, though. Solomon, the son of Seth, was reborn as Jesus. The baptism of water administered by John as representative of Jehovah, freed him also. He yielded his body at that moment to the descending Christ spirit and ranged himself with the new leader. Religion has been terribly tarnished in the course of time. Its pristine purity has long since vanished under the regime of creed, and it is no longer Catholic, that is to say, universal. Sects and isms have branched out in one direction and another, but still, Jesus, from the invisible worlds, enfolds in his love all the sons of Seth who will call upon his name by faith, and he will eventually unite the scattered churches in the kingdom of Christ. Christian Rosencruz was given charge of the sons of Cain, who seek the light of knowledge at the sacred fires of the mystic shrine. As the creative energy implanted by their divine ancestor, Samael, caused Cain to work out their own salvation through the fire of tribulation, and fashion for themselves the golden wedding garment, which is the open sesame to the invisible world, and Though the cleansing blood of Jesus is an absolute necessity to millions of weaker brothers, there can scarcely be any question when we assert that the more men and women who engage in mystic masonry to consciously build this temple of the soul, the sooner we shall see the second advent of Christ, and the stronger will be the race which he shall rule by the law of love. And that's the end of the book right there, folks. But do you see what they're saying? They're saying that uh, what the opposite of what Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us he is the way. And they're acknowledging here that Jesus is the way. But they're saying, oh, that he's only the way for weaker brothers. You see that? They believe themselves superior. They really firmly believe that they are a semi-divine bloodline. Okay? That's what this is all about. They think they can achieve this salvation, this golden wedding garment they're talking of, this transmutation uh, into the next higher spirit state. They believe they could achieve this through works, through gnosis, through all of these different ideas. And, you know, here's the thing, okay? Um, regardless of what they say, we know what the Bible says, okay? We know what Jesus says, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man come to the Father except through him. Okay? Well, these folks, they claim they can get there through their own works. Now, here's my premise, okay? Maybe they can. Let's, let's just assume, okay, that maybe they're right and they can do that. Well, if Jesus made it possible for all of us to do that without having to do this work that they're doing then wouldn't it be a sure bet to follow Jesus? Hmm? What would you have to lose? Whereas these folks, they, they work so heartily towards this stuff, and they're misguided in a lot of what they do. Uh, these that, those that consider themselves the philosophers of fire. See, they, they have this uh, hubris to them. They believe themselves better than the rest of us and they think we're just stupid animals and that they're far superior 
um, intellectually and spiritually. And they think they don't need a savior. They don't need uh, this uh, aspect of things, that they could do it themselves. And yet they still wonder why they've been unable to reunite the ideas of fire and water. Why, um, you know, Hiram Abiff didn't know how to uh, reunify the, the water idea with this golden sea that he, he built. You see that? They, they can't see their nose past their faces. They don't see how they're in the wrong. They, they think they're in the right, and they think that they are smart enough and mighty enough and uh, have enough knowledge, and if they keep seeking after these secrets, that they could get there on their own without having to serve, uh, you know, what they would call a, another master or, or having to go through uh, this doorway that is Jesus, you see. And that's why uh, at the heart of things here, a lot of these people, they have trouble with this idea. And even when you look at the other side of this, the Jesuits and their teachings, it's all twisted and perverted as well. See, all these things, they've taken some of these old mystery school ideas, and they've taken, uh, you know, the, the, the texts of the Bible and these different religious ideas and archetypes and twisted them all into this inverse, uh, perverted kind of an idea. And they think they could become God that way, okay? And that's what they act towards, and that's why the world's in the state that it is. So even though they're seeking to reunify these two archetypal ideas of the fire and the water together to bring about this new age of air, uh, they can't see that the fault in what they're thinking is, okay? And that's that's part of the problem because they believe themselves so far superior to us that uh, they're they're blinded by their own hubris, okay? So this is what this all equates to. Now they do equate some different truths in these different uh, philosophies and in some of these different uh, teachings and stuff that they do, but they twist it and pervert it all completely inverse of how it's supposed to be and how the Creator intended it all to be. And he made a way for everybody. And all you got to do is accept it. It's a free gift, you see. And they don't want to accept the free gift because they think this is something they need to work towards. That if they work towards it and do it themselves without the acceptance of the free gift, that they're somehow superior. Or that they could even do this. And they, they can't see the fault in their thinking that we're limited human beings. We're finite beings. We can't. Uh, know the divine without the divine reaching out to us. So this is where there's that tragic flaw in thinking. And a lot of these people intend well. Uh, see, that that's the thing. Most Freemasons and stuff you talk to, they're generally good people. And most of them don't get that deep into this stuff. They don't get far enough down the trail here to get to these secret teachings and these mystery teachings at the end of it all. And uh, a lot of them don't see the fault in their ways once they get there. Or the ones that do, when they get there, they just keep their mouth shut to go along to get along. Because by the time they realize what they've gotten themselves involved with, it's too late for them to back out. So that's why it's important we bring these ideas into the light and talk about them. So, anyway, that's the end of uh, this video, folks. Uh, I hope you appreciate this. And I hope everybody has a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and a happy whatever holidays you celebrate. Uh, you know, we're, we're just past the solstice now, so uh, uh, we can see ourselves firmly setting foot into this new age ahead. And uh, who knows for sure what that's going to hold for us. So I wish everybody well. I uh, hope you have a great uh, higher-minded new year ahead. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me. Like and subscribe.